Hello, everyone. This is uh, JJ Arisha with Pismo Ventures. And today we have uh, another great webinar. Yesterday we had our first webinar uh, with uh, Barbara Russell uh, from Cap W out of Boston, uh, which is a uh, private equity firm, I'm sorry, a venture firm out of Boston. And today we have uh, two um, IP attorneys, Bruce Itchkowitz, which I always um, you know, pronounce it right. That's what Bruce told me, which is great. Yes. And uh, Greg Hermanson. Okay, I did that one right, right? So <laughs> there you go. All right. So Bruce and Greg are from uh, Kenobi Martins, and Kenobi Martins is one of the um, really great and and prominent um, and well known law firm here in Southern California. Um, they have offices, uh, I think, on the West. Is that correct, uh, Bruce? And, and Greg? Also, yes, uh, but also in New York and DC. All right, New York and DC as well. Um, so Greg is out of the San Diego office and Bruce is out of the Irvine office. Um, I will let them introduce themselves in a few minutes. Just wanted to um, get everyone to um, um, tell them about the program today. So it's very easy webinar or with open Q&A. So you can ask your questions anytime uh, during the webinar. Um, and then we will have at the end of the webinar, we will have about 10 minutes where if someone wants to raise their hand and come in and ask their questions via a video and audio, they can do that as well. Um, we um, also, um, we will have a virtual networking uh, right after the, uh, this webinar. So if you'd like to join the virtual networking to connect with uh, other um, entrepreneurs, startups and investors and sponsors, please do so. Um, if you have not, uh, for some reason, if you have not finished your uh, submission for uh, the application, if you are a startup competing, uh, competing in this um, uh, business plan competition, please do so as soon as possible. There's really a few days left. So this is it. There's another webinar tomorrow. It's by Fred Haney. Fred Haney um, is doing the, uh, uh, he has a book called The Fundable Startup and his webinar will be about the fundable startup. Um, Bruce and Greg, take it from here. Sure. Go ahead, Bruce. Well, thanks, JJ. I, I think I'm pronouncing that correctly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, glad to be, both Greg and I are glad to be presenting today about the, an aspect of patent law that is, it's rather basic, but it, it can be the, uh, the subject of some confusion. And so we hope to alleviate some of that today. Uh, just to let you know, uh, I'm a, a, a patent attorney at Kobe Martins, as JJ said, I've been practicing for just over 20 years now, after having been a uh, research scientist, a physicist at various labs, decided to get out of the lab, get into law, and very glad I've done that. Uh, I'll let Greg just briefly introduce himself as well. Yeah, I'm uh, very happy to be here. And again, also, JJ, thanks for having us. Um, so I've been with Kenobi Martins for about 18 years now. Uh, my background is in imaging science. And like Bruce, I um, had a career in the industry, worked for General Dynamics on a number of uh, big uh, computer systems for the government, and then decided to go to law school and um, been pursuing patent law, uh, like I said, for 18 years. So, so let's get into it, but um, we're going to be talking to you about uh, patent claims. And they are probably the, the most important aspect of uh, patents, and they're the most difficult part to get right, frankly. And uh, that has been uh, reinforced by judges, uh, for example, uh, Judge Gile Rich, who at the time was the chief judge of the federal circuit. That's the appeals court that is in charge of deciding all patent matters. Uh, he has a quote, to coin a phrase, the name of the game is the claim. Uh, just reinforcing the fact that when trying to figure out what a patent covers or whether it doesn't cover, whether it's valid or invalid, you focus on the claims of the patent. And we're gonna talk about what those claims are exactly. The U.S. Supreme Court reinforced that um, about 130 years ago, saying the claims of the patent, particularly if the invention be at all complicated, 
constitute one of the most difficult legal instruments to draw with accuracy. So it, not only are they important, but they're hard to get right. And in a much later case, in the early 60s, the Supreme Court also said that the claims can frequently fail to describe with the required certainty the exact invention. Uh, they could either be erroneous because they're claiming something that the patentee actually didn't invent, or they're omitting some of the essential features of the actual invention. And we're going to touch on what it means to be an essential feature of the invention as we go on. So Greg and I hope to cover today a, a few aspects of the claims. First, what are they? And what is the scope of the claims? What do they cover? And what is their role in various important questions in patent law? For example, how do the claims factor into whether you can get a patent or not? Uh, how do the claims of some patent that you come across determine whether you're infringing that patent or not? And how do you determine whether your competitor is infringing your patent or not? The claims are the key aspect of that analysis, of all those analyses. So what we hope that you'll get out of it at the end of the day is that we're not trying to turn you into patent attorneys or to give you legal advice. What we want you to be able to do is use this information to better communicate and work with your patent attorneys in drafting claims that are valuable for your company and for getting those valuable claims through the patent office. Uh, the information that we're providing you today will hopefully help you make a, a better first pass in deciding whether you need to ask your patent attorney to do a deeper dive in terms of how does any third party patent affect you or your company. So let me jump into it. What are the claims? You, know, you may have seen patents or patent applications. Uh, ho hopefully you've seen uh, one or the other during at some point. Uh, the claims are a subset of that overall document. They are the numbered sentences that are at the end of the document, typically. And they define the boundary between what is your invention and what is not your invention. So if you think of it sort of as a, in a real estate context, they, the claims are the fence uh, around the area that is the invention. And anything outside of the fence is not the invention. So here in this uh, slide, I'm just showing the first page of a patent. And as you go to the, if you flip down to the back, you'll see these numbered sentences. And I'm going to zoom in on what they are more specifically in a moment. What the claims are not are, they are not the figures, for example, what is shown in the, on the right side, and they aren't the rest of the text. You know, they aren't the abstract or the title or the, the meat of the application or the patent, which describes the invention in, in more of its uh, particular detail. So these sections are helpful at, in part in deciding what, the uh, patent covers or not, but, but they aren't as important as the claims. Uh, they can be helpful to define what the claim terms mean, but we're not gonna focus on that. We're gonna sort of take a more simplistic view or a first pass view in terms of what do the claims say or not, and how, is it, how are the claims important to these analyses? So let's take a closer look at these example claims. The, the claims at the end of a patent or an application are organized in one or more groups. Each group has one independent claim and one or more dependent claims. So as shown here, the, an independent claim, here's an example, claim one is an independent claim. It's independent because it doesn't refer to any other claim in the, in the list of claims. So this claim is to, in particular, is to a tubular lamp, and it has certain features. It has a tube, it has an, at least one electrode, it has a phosphor material, and it has a protective material. Claim two is a dependent claim. 
And you know that because claim two refers to claim one. So claim two was actually interpreted to mean everything that is in claim one, the tube, the electrode, the phosphor material, the protective material, as well as the additional feature that is listed explicitly in claim two, that the outer diameter of the tube is less than approximately three millimeters in this example. So a group doesn't merely have one dependent claim typically, it typically has dependent claims. They each refer to one of the earlier claims. The ones that are circled, shown by the circles in red, are referring to the independent claim. So claim three is everything that's in claim one plus what is explicitly in claim three. Claim four, the same thing. Everything in four along with what's in one. Claim six, let, let's jump down to that. That refers to claim five, which itself is dependent from claim one. So claim six is interpreted to be everything in claim six plus everything in claim five plus everything in claim one. And you can look at that for each of the dependent claims. They're dependent off of one or more independent, uh, dependent or independent claims uh, listed before it. Now, as I mentioned before, the claims are the fence or the, the legal definition of the invention. Here on the right, I'm showing the independent claim that we just looked at, as well as some of the dependent claims. The, what do I mean by the claim providing the legal definition? I mean that the claim covers any product or method, if it's a claim to a method, that includes each and every feature that's recited by the claim. So for example, claim one covers all tubular lamps that have the tube, the at least one electrode, the phosphor material, and the protective material. The covered product, the products that are covered by claim one can include other features as well. Uh, and we'll talk about that in a little bit more detail. In general, well, even, even more, uh, it, it's more of a truism that the independent claims are the broadest claims of any patent. And the dependent claims are the narrowest, or are narrower than the independent claim. And so I like to show that by sort of using a Venn diagram. Uh, here I'm showing a circle, which is the Venn diagram of all tubular lamps that have the tube, the electrode, the phosphor material, and the protective material. So in this circle is everything that has A, B, C, and D in it. Everything outside the circle is missing one or more of those. And so that, this is a pictorial representation of the scope of the independent claim. Well, now if we look at the dependent claim, let's look at claim seven, which is dependent from claim one, but it has some additional stuff in it. So as I mentioned before, the dependent claim has everything in the dependent claim plus everything that's in the independent claim. So here in the Venn diagram, claim seven is represented by this slightly darker circle. It's fully within the lighter circle of claim one, but it's a subset. It's everything that has A, B, C, D, and E in it. The area that is within the outermost circle, but is outside of the circle representing claim seven, are everything that has A, B, C, and D in it, but does not have E. And you can do the other dependent claims like this as well. Claim eight is dependent from seven, which as I said, claim, depends from claim one. So claim eight is a subset of what's in claim seven. And claim nine, which depends from claim eight, is a subset of that. So what this is showing you is the, a truism in that the longer a claim is, the more things that it has to have in it, the narrower it is, or the less area that it covers. And that can be important in evaluating whether a claim is uh, important in terms of whether you infringe it or not, whether it covers your competitor's product or not, and whether you might be able to <clears throat> or not. 
So I'm now going to turn things over to Greg. Thanks, Bruce. So um, in addition to uh, some of the technical requirements that um, Bruce was just talking about, uh, claims also have to meet certain legal requirements under the patent laws. Um, a big topic now, of course, is what is eligible subject matter. Um, so claims are meant to be under the current law to cover devices, materials, drugs, processes, methods of fabrication and methods of use. Uh, and devices is a very broad term um, that can cover anything from a single item like a nail or screw to something a little bit larger like a laser assembly, um, a neural network control system, or even a large recycling industrial uh, equipment. Um, uh, the claims cannot be abstract ideas and they can't encompass physical phenomena, algorithms, or compounds found in nature. Um, basically, uh, it's something that has to be made by man. Um, the, this, the issue of patent eligible subject matter most often comes into play nowadays with software and pharmaceutical inventions. Um, and so that's one area where the case law is changing uh, week to week and the, the patent office is having a difficult time trying to define where that line always is. And so that's one area that's um, where a patent attorney uh, who's been tracking the latest case law uh, may be able to shed some additional light on exactly where that patent eligible subject matter line is for software and pharmaceutical inventions. Um, the claims also, also should be technical solutions to technical problems. Um, they can't be business practices. They can't just claim a bunch of data or goals. Um, the focus of the claim should be on technical features. Uh, and for example, for devices, what is the structure that you're claiming that you've invented? What is new about the structure, about the technical features that are in your claims? Um, the claims also must be clear, not indefinite. Uh, they, and they have to be specific, not omnibus. What we use, when we say omnibus, what we, in some jurisdictions, they're allowed to say, um, write broader claims than they can in the US and say, everything that might be shown in a figure or everything that's a process that uses um, any of the devices shown in the, um, in a certain range of claims. In the US, you can't do that. Um, and there's a reason besides, um, there's a couple of reasons why they, they should be clear and not indefinite. And one is just for the examination process. Um, the examiner has to be able to determine if the claims are patentable or not. And they have to look at the, the features in the claims and conduct a prior art search. And uh, if the claims are vague or indefinite, or they're not clear or they're ambiguous, uh, it makes the examiner's job very difficult. And often as a result, you may get as a first response from the patent office, uh, something that you may think looks unreasonable, but the reason the examiner came up with this um, response or this office action was because of the claims are not definite enough. Um, the claims also must be supported by the originally filed disclosure. So once you file a patent application, uh, the patent application includes the description, the figures, and the claims. Uh, you can amend the claims during the prosecution, and we'll be talking about that in a minute, but the description and the figures uh, cannot be changed. And so everything that goes into the claims must be directly supported by the description and the figures. And then <clears throat> also the claims must be patentable um, as viewed under the uh, guidance of being novel or new and non-obvious in view of all the prior art in the world. The prior art includes previous patents, previous patent applications, uh, publications, anything that's out there um, in public uh, that the examiner can point to, uh, to show that, that your invention or, the, or parts of your invention were already out there in public. So again, the, um, in order to be patentable, a claim must be novel. And 
the patent office defines uh, novel as, as something that's not already known. Um, if it's in the patent office language, if, we're, if, a, if a claim is rejected um, for not being novel, we say it's anticipated. And it's often like a single publication, <clears throat> excuse me, or a single device that shows your invention. Um, oftentimes, uh, that's usually not the hardest thing to get around. That's either, if you have something that's, it can be pretty clearly determined if that one item has been done or not before. What's more difficult, a more difficult hurdle is to get over non-obvious. And when the patent office examines the claim, they have to make the determination whether the claimed invention would not be obvious to a person skilled in the art in view of publicly known information, which is, basically any known information, including patents, publications, products, et cetera. And again, as Bruce talked about before, this is often represented with uh, Venn diagrams for better understanding. For example, um, if something is, uh, this, first, this first circle uh, demonstrates something that's not novel, these, these purple, um, geometric features or designs represent prior art. And as can be seen, there's at least several pieces of art that show um, this, uh, what the claim is, if, if this is a circle of the claim. And the, the reason this can happen is because, as you saw in the previous example of the claim, uh, the claim can be pretty broad. So maybe these prior pieces of prior art are, are a little bit different, but because the claim is broad enough, it still, it still would these these articles or these devices would still fall within the limitations of the claim. And because they fall within the limitations, they also show that it's not novel. Um, in, this, in this diagram here, which is a little bit smaller, uh, none, of the, none of the prior art, not one single piece of prior art actually shows the claim. However, this is an example of where an examiner may combine um, several pieces of art that each have a couple of the elements of your claim to make the assertion that somebody of skill in the art would review these other pieces of art and come up with your invention. Or in some cases, it can be a, a piece of an art and then a product. Or in some cases, it can even be a single piece of art that somebody of skill in the art would review. And then because you're claiming something that may not be significant enough, uh, as a technological improvement, somebody of skill in the art would easily make that, uh, be able to make that change. And then lastly, um, this circle, of course, again, demonstrates that something that's far enough away from the prior art to be novel and non-obvious. And uh, if it meets all the other criteria, then it's patentable. So um, part of the, Part of the real challenge of writing an application is actually drafting the claims. And the, the ch part of the challenge is, is what is the purpose of the claim? And what is the goal? What is the ultimate goal of the patent application and the claim? Uh, and it depends on the company, depends on the technology. Um, the the a patent can offer a company value protection, valuable protection in the marketplace. Uh, they, the patent gives the owner of the patent the right to exclude others from making and using the claimed invention. And um, if a patent is written uh, in a way that it protects the choke points for a certain technology, that can be of great value. Um, uh, and so that's one thing when we talk to clients, we, we try to understand the, what their business is, their business model, what things can be easily changed by, by a competitor and what things are critical uh, to the success of their technology and their company. And those critical items, those choke points are typically the most valuable thing to try to include in the, in the, the claim language itself. Uh, for example, if you had a claim that was, um, if the, the real important part was having the phosphor on the outside of a tube lamp to achieve this desired uniformity, um, as opposed to inside or somewhere else or, or, or any other feature of the tube lamp, like the size, the, the wattage or the materials, other materials, 
if this was the critical feature, then that would be what we want to try to include in the claim. Um, and another thought about when writing the claims is to try to uh, write a mixture of claims with different scopes of protection. As Bruce was talking about, uh, the independent claims have the fewest number of, <coughs> of features, which also makes them the broadest claims. And uh, the idea of those is to try to write a broad claim to encompass as much technology as possible. So if a competitor um, had a similar device, hopefully they would infringe your claim. Um, and you only want to include essential features that may be very difficult for a competitor to uh, design around. Um, and if these features were omitted, they'd be result in a substantially inferior product or method. Um, you also want to have narrower claims uh, to be fallback positions during the examination as well as litigation. Um, so in a typical claim set, like one of the ones that Bruce was showing earlier, there's an independent claim, and then there's a set of dependent claims that depend from the independent claim, and sometimes they depend from other dependent claims that depend from the independent claim. And with each dependent claim, uh, the claims get narrower and narrower, uh, which makes it easy to be, easier to be patentable. It encompasses less, less technology, but it also makes it easier to invalidate because it is narrower. And so what you want to do is cover the invention in various overlapping ways. Um, if you have, oftentimes what we work with clients that have systems that have a lot of a lot of inventions that are in the system. Some of the some of the their, the inventions have to do with just a device. Um, they could be a subassembly within the device, or even a combination of the devices used with other structures. Um, if they've come up with a way of, of manufacturing the device that's novel, um, that can be another way to protect the invention. It's also as a way of method of using the device. Um, and if the device is, can be made in various pieces and then is assembled at another location, um, sometimes you can write very, uh, very important claims that cover intermediate products during fabrication. So even if a particular competitor isn't making the entire product, uh, if they make the, an intermediate product that's covered by the claims, uh, they'll also infringe and you can exclude them from doing that. So the claim should also be written with an eye towards the prior art. Um, the, the inventors we work with are, are typically people of skill in the art, and they know, they know uh, a lot about what's out there, at least what's commercially out there. Um, uh, for everything that's out there commercially, of course, there's, there's a, a wide range of publications, and as well as uh, patents and patent applications that are in, typically in the same technolo technology area. Um, and so it, it's important to not only, you know, take a look at what you know, but also uh, perhaps do some searching and, and look around before you write your claims, because that's going to, in, in a way, limit the, the amount of claim coverage you're going to be able to get. Um, the patent office, when they examine the claims, they will do their search and they will ensure that it doesn't encompass any of the prior art. Uh, and so when you write the uh, claims, um, if, if, you're writing, if you're trying for something very, very broad, uh, they may find lots of art on it. Um, uh, if you're writing for something narrower, of course, you have a much better chance of getting it, it through, but uh, uh, it, it's gonna only cover a, a much more limited area. Um, there's no requirement to do prior art searching. Um, uh, there's a, you are um, obligated to tell the patent office of all prior art that's relevant that you're aware of. Uh, but we've always found it to be a great idea, especially if a company is going to put in uh, a lot of money into a, a certain technology area um, to do some searching, at least do some searching just to see if what's been done before. Uh, and um, it also it educates um, both the patent attorney and the company as to the landscape of what's out there, which is a great guide in drafting claims. And that way you also won't be surprised during examination 
uh, when you find, if you find something that, that should have been found with a quick search. Um, uh, as well as um, using a law firm to do searches or a searching company, there's also uh, uh, ways to do self-searching. I think everybody is familiar with uh, Google, Patents Google. Um, there's also, you can use the USPTO site for patent searching, um, as well as other, several other sites as well. So during examination, um, uh, the, the focus of the whole examination is on the claims. Now, the examiner will review the description and the drawings to make sure they meet uh, the patent requirements, but the focus of the examination is on the claims. And uh, the examiners are typically very uh, skilled in the art and very knowledgeable, especially in the particular art that they're searching, the, the, the patents that they're examining. And they'll do searches for references uh, that are related to your specific claim language. They do word searches, they do uh, category searches, and they will find uh, the art that's specific to your claim language that you have in the, in the actual claim, uh, as opposed to looking at what's in the description, the abstract, or the figures. Um, after they do their search, they will uh, write it up and document it and send out an office action. And that'll be, it's typically the applicant's first feedback from the patent office on the initial evaluation of patentability. Greg, I just wanna interrupt. We, we've received a question with regard to first to file versus first to invent, and also talking about a provisional patent application. Uh, what I wanna suggest is that Greg and I would be happy to answer those questions at the end of the, in a Q&A, but since the, neither of them really focus on the claims, uh, I'd rather put them off to the side for now, if that's okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah, we can, we can answer both those at the end. That's fine. Yeah. Okay, Bruce, can you... Uh, oh. Sure. <laughs> so, so for, for example, this is, is an example. Um, the office action may show, uh, this might be the result of the office action where the independent claim one, the examiner was able to find a reference X that discloses the limitations A through E for claim one. And therefore, the office action would indicate that claim one is not, it was rejected uh, as being uh, not novel or being anticipated by reference X. The office action then may go on to show that, rep, that the examiner found another reference, reference Y, that discloses um, the element F. Uh, and so that reference, reference Y, when it's combined with reference X, uh, makes claim two obvious. Uh, again, they're asserting that somebody of skill in the art would review reference X and reference Y and know to combine those two um, those features to show your invention. Um, the office action may then further sh go on to, to say that they could not, the examiner couldn't find any prior art that shows element G. So in this case, uh, claim three is patentable. And so what that means is if you end up rewriting claim three, that would have all the limitations of claim two and claim one, because those are the claims it depends from, then that claim, uh, the total claim would be, would be patentable. So how do you respond to an office action? Um, and, and again, if you, if you haven't been through the patent process before, once you submit a uh, patent to the patent office, it can take anywhere from months to years to get your first office action response. Um, uh, once you get it, then you have to decide how to respond. And you can respond either by arguing or rebutting what the examiner has asserted without making any claim amendments, or you can amend the claims. Um, often because the examiners, uh, they, they do read the, the, the description, they look at the figures to interpret the claim language, but they're getting claims written by a wide variety of people. And so perhaps the examiner misinterpreted what the invention is or misinterprets uh, a particular word in the claim and therefore maybe the examiner misapplied the references or is misapplying the law. So in that case, uh, 
it, it can be useful uh, and to move this case forward to just submit arguments and educate the examiner on, on what the claims really mean, what the purpose of the invention is, and uh, perhaps that way it can be overcome, the rejection can be overcome. Um, another way is to amend the claims. Um, and so you can add features to claim one like we showed in the previous example, or any other feature that's in the description or shown in the figures. Um, uh, you wanna be a little careful here not to uh, unduly narrow the claims so that they're no longer valuable. So you want to be very careful about, and because of the time delay of when you file the application, and you might be doing this uh, examination, um, perhaps the product has changed, whether it's your product or a competitor's product that you're trying to cover under your claim. So once you get the office action back, it's a good time to review your own technology, see what is still relevant, and make sure that any claim amendments you make uh, still cover still cover the, the device, the process that you're trying to claim. And it's the same with if you're just going to argue the claim. Even if the examiner misinterpreted the claim, uh, there's a possibility because of the time lag is that your product may have evolved and now the claim that you originally submitted may not cover it as well as it should. So even if the examiner uh, maybe has misinterpreted the claim, you still may want to amend the claims to more uh, to better cover your current product. Um, uh, in if in like the example before, if if claim three is valuable, uh, you may want to add it, the features of claims two and three to claim one. If it's not valuable or if the product has changed, uh, you may want to come up and develop uh, completely different uh, amendments to, to address this. Um, and a lot of this has to do with, uh, again, the status of the company, the status of the product, uh, what, what you're trying to get with the, with the, uh, the patent right now. Uh, perhaps it's important to investors to raise investment money to get have a patent um, issued. In that case, you might be more willing to take what the USPTO is willing to give you rather than argue and rebut the examiner and go back and forth a number of times until you get um, the claim you want. Um, also for the amendments, uh, like I mentioned before, they have to be in the application. Um, they can't be pulled out of thin air. Um, it's best if they're explicitly um, described and recited and shown in the originally filed application. There's a little bit of wiggle room, um, but it's best if, you, uh, if they're explicitly shown. And, and that's why when you write the application, you should include as much detail as possibly known at the time. Um, again, if the claim is, is being used to pursue and cover a competitor's product, um, it's a good time to reevaluate the competitor's product. Has it changed? Is there a new product? Uh, products have a certain life and um, in, some in some areas that life is only maybe only a, a couple of years. So it's a good time to take a look at the product, see if it's changed and see where the, the product line may be going towards. Um, it's also time to consider the prior art. You, in the office action, the examiner has provided a list of the art that he's used to reject the, the claims. And so it's a good time to review that prior art and perhaps even do additional art searches from maybe the companies that, um, that, have, uh, that that art has been assigned to. You know, if it's maybe it's Intel, the prior art reference from Intel, you may wanna to look to see what else they've been doing to, to see if, if any additional claim amendments to make, uh, if it'll, um, step into their their other art that's there and again it should be all the claim amendments should be based on the original disclosure so this is just a quick example of how a claim can evolve during examination so in this case we submitted an original independent claim uh, a method of forming a gel monolith the method comprising um, and we refer that as to the preamble and then it has um, five different um, limitations, elements that are examined uh, by the examiner. Uh, as a result of this, of this uh, examination, the patent office has issued a first office action and um, rejecting the claim. And so uh, at that point, you may want to look at the art and say, okay, there's something else in my spec, uh, my, in my application that I can add 
to get to get over the uh, rejection. And in this case, they added the limitation that the third solution having a catalyst concentration greater than three mole percent of the third solution. Uh, and so, um, what they've done here then is is you, you review the art, you find that your application has this limitation in it, and the art that was cited by the examiner and also known to you does not show that limitation. So in your response to the patent office, you would amend the claim one to include that limitation. Uh, the, the, the examiner would then look at that amendment and dig in a little bit and do another prior art search and perhaps find uh, additional references that show um, either that limitation or other some of the other limitations. So in response, what you may want to do is, is make a few other amendments um, to again, narrow the claim to exclude the references from the technology that you're trying to claim. Uh, again, think of the Venn diagram. Every time you add words to the claim, it makes the circle representing the claim a little bit smaller. And what you're trying to do is carve out the space between all the other pieces of prior art um, in order to get something that's far enough away from it that the examiner thinks uh, and will allow it to be um, patented. And then finally, if that was successful, uh, it'll result in an allowance. Um, and again, this, this whole process can take anywhere from a few months to seven or eight years. There are ways to fast track it, but that, that's another consideration um, during, the, during the, another strategy is to is think about, you know, knowing this is gonna take a while, is it worthwhile paying additional fees to have it fast tracked? Or in some cases, it might be more worthwhile to have the, the application pending and uh, as deferring costs for examination for years. So there's a lot of strategy that goes involved into um, how fast uh, you're even trying to push this through, through the, the patent office. And then at this, at this point, I think I'll turn it back over to Bruce. Okay, thanks, Greg. So what, what Greg was describing, let's see, make sure I, there we go. So Greg gave a really good explanation of how the claims are relevant to whether you can get your patent or not and, and how that process uh, proceeds. So the other question, one of the other questions we wanted to touch on is, how do you evaluate a third party patent? You know, for example, your, your CTO comes all a flutter in your office saying, waving this document saying, we found out that our competitor just got this patent uh, and we have to deal with it to figure out whether it covers our product or not. You know, do they have, do they have the right to exclude us from selling our product? And there are two prongs to that, to the evaluation that needs to be done. And they both focus on the claims. The first is the non-infringement prong. Basically, do any of the claims in this third party patent, in this case, you know, a competitor's patent, do any of those claims cover your product? Uh, generally, this is a, a first pass prior to getting your patent attorney to do the deeper dive. Uh, this is an aspect that hopefully you can use the information that we're providing today to at least get some sense about whether your product is infringing one or more of the claims of the third party patent. Uh, the other prong is the invalidity prong. And that question is, do the claims cover your, do the claims that are covering your product? Okay. So claims that at least on their face seem to be infringed by the product in the first prong, do those same claims cover the prior art? Um, now this can often be a more complex analysis um, that is part of the deeper dive that you ask your uh, patent attorney to do. So just a, a couple cautions with regard to this because you know, admittedly we're giving you a simplistic view of, of the process. Uh, hopefully it's a, it's a valuable simplistic view, but I want you to know that there are subtleties that each of these analyses to both the non-infringement and the invalidity prongs. They, they both depend on the interpretation of the claim language. Uh, and that interpretation can be affected by other aspects that we're not going into in today's presentation, like the, the text of the 
patent that are not part of the claims or the amendments and the statements that the third party made to the patent office in getting the patent to issue. All those can be factors in determining what does a claim term mean or what it doesn't mean. And so both of these analyses are dependent on that to some degree. Uh, there are also some other considerations with regard to the patent law that we're just not diving into because it would just take too long. Uh, there's something, uh, for example, you could infringe by a substantial equivalent, you know, whether the, the portion of your product that does the same job uh, re resulting in the same result in the same way as what is in the claim, that might be interpreted to basically be that claim uh, feature. And so that's why you need a patent attorney to, to do the deeper dive in, in both of these analyses. So let's, sort of, let's do an example that's based on, hopefully we'll keep in mind some of the Venn diagram stuff that we've been talking about. Um, in this example, we have your product, which is shown there in the lower right. It's a, uh, a fluorescent tube light, uh, a tubular lamp, as it were. And the claim one of, the, uh, of your competitor's patent is the same claim that I had been talking about previously with regard to a tubular lamp. It has the tube, it has the at least one electrode, it has the phosphor material, and it has the protective material, A, B, C, and D. So the, the, the non-infringement prong in determining do any of the claims cover your product is to compare your product or your method, if it's, an, if it's a claim to a method, to each independent claim. So here we're showing the, the one independent claim of, the, of this particular patent. And the claim is not infringed, which is good for you, right? Your product, you don't want it infringing a third party patent. The claim is not infringed by your product if your product omits at least one feature. As you recall, when I was talking before, a claim covers everything that has each and every element. So if you omit one of those elements, the claim does not cover your product. So for example, let's say your product has the tube and it has the electrode, it has the protective material, but it doesn't have a phosphor material on the outer surface of the tube. Well, that's great. You're not infringing because you omitted one of the features that is recited in the independent claim. Well, what if your product has the tube, the electrode, the protective material, but it has a, a phosphor material that maybe uh, generates infrared light. It doesn't generate visible light as is recited in the claim. Well, okay, so here I'd say, well, okay, we don't have C, but we have C prime, it, it's something close. Well, arguably, uh, it, I mean, it depends on how close it is, you know, in terms of what the, law says interpreting claim language and such. But if you don't have that feature, you don't have C, you have C prime, you're not infringing, at least not at first blush, which again is good because you don't want to be infringing the patents of your competitors. But let's take the example of if your product has, it has the tube, it has the electrode, it has the phosphor material on the outer surface and it, it emits visible light, and it has the protective material. But wait, you have U-shaped tubes. Nothing in the claim says anything about U-shaped tubes. Well, that doesn't matter. You have, your product has every one of the features of the claim. It has something else, it has something additional, but you have everything that is in the claim, so therefore your product is infringing this claim one in this example. So it, if you go through this analysis and you figure out, well, wait, our product does not infringe this in the independent claim, or, or in fact, it doesn't infringe any of the independent claims, because the independent claims each include one feat, at least one feature that our product doesn't have. Well, then you don't even have to an, analyze what the dependent claims say or not, because if you're outside the, the fence of the independent claim, and the dependent claims are all subsets within that independent claim, you know by being outside the fence of the independent claim, you're also outside the fences of the dependent claims. However, if your 
product does have every feature of the independent claim, let's say in this example, uh, one of the ways that you can start thinking about how to deal with this third party patent, this competitor patent, is whether do you have some easy design around that you could in, incorporate into your product to avoid infringement? Is there a way that you can remove from your product one or more of these features of the independent claim so that you're no longer infringing? Maybe that's to put the electrode on the inner surface of the tube, or, or maybe you don't even have a, a tube per se. Uh, you have some other type of a configuration. You know, there might be design arounds, and you want to discuss some of these potential aspects with your patent attorney to decide which ones might have more relevance to get around. And of course, it, it factors into whether some of these might be easier or harder to do in the real world. So let, now let's do the example of the invalidity problem, right? Do the claims cover, covering your product also cover the prior art? So we're sort of, we're, we're building upon that, that last example where our tubular lamp has each and every element of this independent claim. It had A, B, C, and D in it. Well, in this, in this prong, you sort of role play as the USPTO examiner, right? Now you're trying to shoot down this claim, this independent claim of your competitor uh, to try to come up with reasons why had the U.S. Patent Office done their job right, if they had, and they had known about the various references that are out there, they would never have issued the patent. In other words, or in particular, the claim. In other words, this claim is invalid. So as in this role play, you develop rejections based, uh, based on the lack of novelty or, and or the obviousness, as Greg was describing. So for example, you might do your own searching to find some references, and maybe you found reference X and you found reference Y. And you see that reference X has features A and B in it, reference Y has features C and D in it, and there's a reasonable rationale for combining the, what is described in these two references. So therefore, in your argument, claim one is obvious in view of reference X plus reference Y, and so claim one is invalid. So even though claim one covers your product, your argument is, well, this claim is too broad because it's also covering the product prior art, which is, makes it invalid. And if you can't find references that have each of these features and or you can't find a reasonable rationale for combining those references that you found, you sort of have to keep searching. If you're gonna to try to use an invalidity argument, you need to know of, to have some of these references in hand. Uh, and searching can be sort of a black box in terms of you keep searching for references to try to shoot down the, the claim. Uh, it, it can be difficult uh, to find. And you need a patent attorney, I think, to put together some, to analyze the references and come up with your best arguments in terms of invalidity. Now in this prong, you can't just focus on the independent claim like you did for the non-infringement prong. Because as Greg had described, some independent claims can be uh, invalid or they can be non-patentable because they cover the prior art, but the more narrow uh, dependent claims could be far enough away from the prior art so that they are valid. So even though an independent claim might be covering your product but be invalid, some of its subsets of dependent claims might, while they cover your product, they might also, they might also be valid. And so you need to figure that out. And so as I mentioned, it often requires maybe multiple rounds of searching if, if there just isn't the types of references that, that you need to, uh, that you have on hand. So what about the question of whether your competitor infringes your patent, all right? The shoe's on the other foot. You have your patent, 
and you're wondering whether the, your competitor that just came out with this new product is infringing your patent. Can you use your patent to stop them from entering the marketplace? Well, for this analysis, you, you have that first prong of infringement. You, to decide whether your competitor is infringing or not, you look at their product or method, and you decide whether their product has each and every feature of at least one of your claims of your patent. So here on the right, I'm showing the example independent method claim that, that Greg had uh, briefly alluded to, the method of forming a gel monolith. And it has its own five features of steps, you know, preparing the, a first solution, a second solution, and then combining them for a third solution, cooling the, that combination, and then allowing it to gel. And your competitor has their own method that uh, you know, may, may or may not have these steps. So what you need to do is look to see, does your competitor's method, in this case, omit at least one of the features of your independent claim? So let's say your competitor's method has the preparing of the first, second, and third solutions, uh, but it doesn't do the cooling or at least it doesn't do the cooling at, uh, as described, as recited uh, in the claim, but it then does allow it to gel. Well, they aren't infringing this claim because your independent claim has a feature that they've been able to avoid using in coming up with their method. Uh, the same thing if they've tweaked one or more of these steps, okay, maybe they don't in this example, they have preparing the first and second solution, but when they prepare their third solution, it has a catalyst concentration that's less than three mole percent. So then they wouldn't be infringing because your claim requires that any infringing method have a catalyst concentration greater than the three mole percent. So they wouldn't be infringing on that basis. But again, if your competitor has all five of these steps, but maybe they've added some other step somewhere in the process. Well, then they are still infringing if they have each and every feature of your claim. And as it was when you were deciding whether you're infringing your competitor's patent or not, if the independent claim, if your independent claim is not infringed, then your competitor is not infringing any of your dependent claims. And if your competitor is infringing one of your independent claims, then you actually also want to look at and evaluate whether any of the, your dependent claims are also infringed. Because what the competitor is going to do is they're going to try to invalidate your independent claim. They're going to try to say, well, all right, you know, you got your patent claim, but it's overly broad because it covers the prior art. So they're going to do that searching. They're going to, frankly, they're going to try to turn over every rock and look for every reference they can to try to shoot down your claim, your independent claim, to show that it should, it, it is invalid because it should never have been issued by the US Patent Office. But hopefully you have one or more dependent claims that still cover your competitor's method, but it would be harder for them to shoot that down because that, that smaller scope of dependent claim, while it covers their product, is harder for them to find prior art that to uh, invalidate. Or maybe it might be something that is even, uh, might be more difficult for them to design around. So that, that's part of why dependent claims are so valuable to have uh, in a patent application as a fallback position in case you're in a litigation or, uh, against one of your competitors. So, that brings us to the end of our discussion today of how the claims are important in various questions that you might have with regard to uh, whether your claims, whether your invention is patentable or not, whether you're infringing your products, whether your products are infringing your competitor's patent, or vice versa, whether your competitor's product is infringing your patents. Uh, both Greg and I are very appreciative of your time that um, you spent with us this morning. We welcome any questions you might have now or in the networking that we'll do afterwards, as well as 
if you just want to contact either one of us after offline, you know, we can hopefully maybe answer some simple questions. Uh, maybe not so simple. You know, we don't, we can't give legal advice to anybody that's not uh, an, a client. But if you're interested in pursuing uh, that avenue, we'd be welcome. Uh, we'd welcome that conversation as well. Uh, so now let's let's open it up to the questions, uh, if we can. Uh, I see that we've received a couple others since uh, I started talking, uh, but maybe we can just first sort of take them in line. Uh, the first one came from uh, Mohsen, uh, actually had two of them. First, that we can, can we explain what first to file versus first to invent means? It, it, that is an important aspect of patent law in general. And then also, what is the role of a provisional patent? So. Maybe I can take the first one and then Greg, you'll, you'll take the second one. So under the US, it, it used to be way back when that the first person to invent something is the, is the true inventor and that they are the ones that are allowed to get a patent on that invention. Uh, meanwhile, the rest of the world was in a first to file circumstance. They didn't want to go into the figuring out, okay, who invented what first, right? The first person to file their patent application, right? They got their application stamped with a date and time. They are considered to be the first, they are considered to be the true inventor and they're the ones that are allowed to get the patent. That way they can avoid this issue of, okay, who really invented first? You know, maybe, maybe you invented it before they got their uh, application on file but these foreign jurisdictions didn't really care about that. First one to the goal line won in terms of being able to get the patent. Well, the US has changed their law to be more in conformance with the rest of the world. Now the, now the US is under what's called a first inventor to file. So in most cases, the US treats it as the same race to the patent office like all these other countries did. The first one to file a patent application is considered to be the one to get their, uh, allowed to try to get their patent. But the US didn't want to give up 100% this issue of who was the first inventor. So they kept the aspect that it's not just anybody, you know, that in the race to the patent office to get an application on file. You do have to have been an inventor of that in uh, technology and be the first to be at the patent office. So you might envision a scenario where an invention is being worked on in parallel by two groups that are, they don't know one another, they're not sharing information, they're not stealing information from one another, but they just happen to come up with the invention at, uh, in parallel with one another. Well, which everyone gets to the patent office first with their, with their application, they in the U.S. would be considered the first to file, first inventor to file. So hopefully that answered your question, Mohan. Uh, let me throw it over to Greg to have him uh, talk about what the provisional patent application is. Yeah, sure. sure. Thanks, Bruce. So um, we, uh, we, we employ that strategy quite a bit, uh, and that is to file a provisional patent application, and then you have one year to convert that provisional to a regular application or to do foreign filing. And with the regular application of the foreign filing, you can claim priority to the provisional application. Um, uh, the, the issue with the provisional patents, though, is it's always is the disclosure. And in your question, you, meant, you mentioned low fee. And so what we often see is that either something filed by a company or an inventor or another um, low fee filer um, is that the, the provisional application is not sufficient. Um, it doesn't have the technical detail. It doesn't have all of the things that you may want to someday put into a claim. So if the provisional patent application doesn't have the, the right wording, the right words, the right description of the technology, uh, you may not be able to get that information into a claim. And so when you file the regular application and claim priority to the provisional, uh, you only get priority to what's actually in the provisional patent application. So that's just something to be aware of. But 
Um, we certainly do file provisionals all the time just for that reason. It is almost always lower cost. Um, it's almost always faster. Provisional applications can be anything from a PowerPoint presentation to a full-blown 100 page long application that's ready to, to file as a utility application. Um, uh, sometimes it's lower fees, sometimes it's not. Um, but it is definitely you know, a strategy that we employ to get something on file because it is still a race to the patent office. Um, but you want to make sure that you have sufficient disclosure that will some, that so, so someday you can have that language in the claims. Um, and, and I'll let me address the third question, which was why was Uber software not patented? This allowed Lyft and others to imitate and be successful. Um, so uh, as that question came, this is a very interesting topic for me, especially with Uber. Um, uh, and so Uber does have patents and they have a lot of applications pending. Um, uh, but this is the type of question that I think highlights the whole topic we were just talking about, which is the claims. They may have uh, patents that have been issued, but the question is, what do the claims say? What in, so I pulled up just one random Uber patent that was allowed and granted, and it's 9959512. And um, it's for a computer controlled method for doing something related to Uber. But the, like the first claim is uh, like a page and a half long. And so that would be a very narrow claim. And now maybe they had to do that to get the claim allowed. And maybe it still covers the aspect of the technology that they're trying to cover. But at least in this application, they didn't get the, they didn't get the claim saying, uh, you know, an app on a phone for ordering a taxi. Um, and, and, and very high essential broad claim. Um, they may have that somewhere else, maybe it's, but it's those claims, it, it, that's why when you do a patent search, it's often interesting to see how early these initial ideas were filed. Um, somebody probably filed that initial idea when they came out, when the internet started becoming uh, ubiquitous. Um, people are thinking decades ahead for some of this technology. Um, so, so I'd, I'd encourage you to use one of those, um, either Google patents or um, another one of those searches and take a look at the Uber patents, um, see what's pending, see what's been granted and look at the, look at the claims and see, you can see if the claim is really, really long, then it's probably something that they've had to increase in length during prosecution in order to get it allowed. Um, uh, if they, you know, if they could get a claim to, uh, exclude other, lift, lift from doing it, I'm sure they would have. <laughs> and, right. maybe, and maybe that application is still pending. Um, yeah. It's hard to say. Uh, yeah, that, and Greg, you made a, a great point that, you know, sometimes, you know, you, you get, you find this patent and, oh my goodness, I look at the title. It, or look at the abstract. They're, they're trying to cover using a, a smartphone to call a taxi. Well, uh, well no, you got to look at the claims. The claims are what determine whether that patent is something to be concerned about or not, and whether they can use it to, in this case, uh, you know, stop Lyft from practicing the invention. But that length of the claim, uh, maybe Lyft was able to find out which one of those, maybe more than one of those features they avoided using. So, you know, it's sort of, they don't care whether the, uh, Uber has that patent or not. Uh, let me take a stab at the, the last question that Mohan had. Uh, does it not make sense to have a few independent claims to discourage infringement? Having a lot of independent claims make it easier to copy without infringement. Well, you're exactly right, Mohan. You know, typically a patent has more than one independent claim. And as I think it was on one of the slides that Greg had, where the Venn diagram shows, you know, the area that you're trying to cover is, you know, some a small dot, but you have an independent claim over here that the small dot is within. And you have another independent claim, the small dot is also in that. And these claims overlap in this Venn diagram. And so yes, each of those independent, each of those circles is a fence that the competitor would have to get around to be able to get to copying your product. And so you're, you're exactly right, having a portfolio of protection in terms of, and, and these claims don't even have to be in the same patent. They couldn't maybe be in separate patents, but their effect when you overlap them in this Venn diagram is to, to provide multiple fences, barriers 
that your competitor would need to have to copy you. And on the reverse, if they did copy your product or that target or that choke point that uh, Greg alluded to, they are infringing multiple patents that now if they want to get out from under the thumb of your infringement uh, case, they have to shoot, they have to either show a non-infringement or non, uh, or show that those patent claims were invalid. It just, it, it can up the, the barrier that your competitor needs to deal with in terms of uh, getting around your patent portfolio. Yeah, and I'll just add that, um, you know, we often almost always file a claim set with multiple independent claims. And sometimes uh, you get typically for a patent application, for the normal filing fees, you get three independent claims and 17 dependent claims. Um, there may be cases when you want to file more independent claims and pay the excess claim fees. If you have an invention where there's several, several features that seem very novel that you can reduce the, the claim to, to just include uh, mostly that feature, it may be well worth it to have uh, four, five, six, seven independent claims, each one focusing on a different essential element. Um, sometimes the patent office will, uh, will issue a restriction requirement if the two invent if the all, all the different inventions are are too unrelated to each other, um, but that way you're not including non-essential elements in independent claims that people might be able to uh, not have that feature and therefore not infringe. Um, so yeah, it, it absolutely makes sense to have um, uh, a bunch of independent claims, and we always we always encourage that. So I don't see any other questions coming in, uh, but I want to invite anybody who, who does have some other question to. Yeah, if anyone has has questions, uh, please um, uh, you could raise your hand. Uh, you can click on um, uh, I guess participant, and then uh, you can uh, raise your hand, and we'll we'll be able to uh, you know bring you in. If you have a question, we can bring you in via video and audio as well. So please do that. Uh, we'll, we'll open that up for the next few minutes. Um, uh, first, I want to say I learned so much today. <laughs> I, I thought I knew something, but I, it seems like I didn't know much. <laughs> so, so uh, yeah, I don't know much. So now I, I know a little bit more, but I'm still very dangerous. <laughs> uh, so we got another question from Mohan, if you want to answer that. Yeah, sure. Well, uh, so this question is, why is Qualcomm in the news all the time for patents and royalty issues? Well, le let me just take a high level. First off, we've, we've done some work for Qualcomm. So they have, they have us to thank, perhaps, for some of uh, their strength <laughs> in the marketplace because of their patent portfolio. Uh, I do know that Qualcomm values intellectual property. Uh, both theirs and, and they, they're respectful of others' intellectual property. And the way that they do that is they make sure that their inventions are resources in not just with us, but with other law firms in getting patent protection and, and frankly asserting that patent protection. And what they can do as a large company is, is assert that uh, right to exclude. And that, that's a, a high level answer to the question, hopefully. All right, very good. Um, we have Anthony. Um, so Anthony, I'm gonna bring you on so you can talk. Um, uh, uh, Bruce, you can stop sharing if you want uh, the screen, um, right, okay. but I'll bring Anthony to, I uh, hope uh, Anthony that you have your uh, mic and video on, thank you. Can you hear me? Hello? Oh, we can't hear you, can Anthony. You ah. Now, now we can. Okay, great. Uh, a quick question. Um, give me, can you give me an order of magnitude? I mean, I'm not you know, asking down to the penny, but give me an order of magnitude of the cost of a full patent. What a full patent run, roughly. So it, it can depend on the technology a little bit. Um, and it can also depend a lot on how much information we get 
uh, as an input for the application. I've had uh, a few, very few, but a few um, companies and inventors come to me with, uh, they've, they've, they've looked at, they've researched patents, they've written their patent to be, to mimic something else that's out there that's been issued. The figures are all first rate. There's a lot of description and we, we have to do very little to, um, to the application. In that case, it may be a thousand, a couple thousand bucks. Um, if it's, if somebody gave me a, a very, uh, a, a mechanical device, a very simple mechanical device to patent and they had great figures that showed all the different views of it and the dimensions and the features of it, uh, that would be on the lower side. So then maybe that would be five, six, seven thousand, eight thousand to pick to, uh, and that's just for filing. Um, the prosecution fees we we're dealing with the patent office would be maybe more. And it's very hard to estimate what that would be. Um, for well, so the way I like to explain it, sorry for interrupting, Greg, is that look, attorney time is money. So to the extent that you can reduce the amount of time your patent attorney has to spend in getting the application on file, the cheaper it's going to be done for, or the less expensive it will be. And when I work with startups, and I, and I think Greg does the same thing, you know, to the, we, we try to give you the information that we would like to see, the type of information we'd like to see in that application. And we have you draft the sort of a first pass at it to provide all this information that we want to include, uh, for example, in the provisional. And then maybe there, we look at it and there's some things that are missing in our view or some things that are extraneous that should be taken out. And so we have, we give you our comments on it. We iterate back and forth, maybe once or twice. Then we have a, a provisional application that, we're, that will do the job in terms of the disclosure that that document needs to do. And doing that helps keep the cost down to the lower numbers that uh, Greg had alluded to. Uh, but if you, if you just come to the patent attorney with you know just the broad idea, and uh, and just a description, and you want them to to put pen to paper or or start typing in the application from from a blank screen, that's going to be more costly because it takes more time. Yeah, I think Bruce and I recently worked on a, a quantum computing application that was one of the more complex applications I've ever seen, <laughs> and that and that was probably more in the range of fifteen to twenty thousand. Um, uh, just for the application, um, or maybe even more, but that, that was, and, and, you know, it's part of the problem also is oftentimes uh, somebody will come to us and say, well, this is my system, and can we patent this? And then, and then the question is, well, what is it we're actually trying to patent? What are, what are the, you know, is there a subassembly? Is there a piece of it? What's the important thing? We have to go through the analysis that we talked about during the presentation, and, and maybe there's several patents in there, um, uh, as opposed to, again, if somebody comes to us with a, a spine screw, that's, that's very clearly a, you know, a certain mechanical device of a certain size with certain uh, structural features, um, those are easier, much easier to define and describe. Um, sometimes just a couple great figures and a little bit of description is enough. Um, so, so it really depends on the, the, the technology as well. The other thing I, I would mention in regard to the cost is some, anywhere between a third to a half of the, your attorney time that, that is spent on drafting a, a, non -provisional, a non provisional application is on the claims. They really are the key aspect of a patent application. And so, hopefully, out of this talk, you got an appreciation of how one word or one phrase could be very important to determine what the claim covers or not. Well, your patent attorney spends a lot of time on figuring out exactly what terms to use, what not to use, in conjunction with, you know, consulting with you in terms of, you know, what the invention is or not. But for the applications that I draft, I'd say, a, frankly, I use a third to the half of the time in drafting it just on the claims. Well, the name of the game is claim. That's what you said. <laughs> I've heard that before. I don't yes, know where. I've heard that before. Yeah. Uh, so there you go, Anthony. You got you got um, yeah. a varied answer between two thousand and twenty thousand. How about that? Okay. Uh, I, I thank you for that. Uh, quick question, because I've spoken to some other patent attorneys, and they said, "Wow, it could 
run almost eighty thousand dollars. So I guess it depends truly on what the work that's being done has to occur, right? They, they, they may have been talking about from drafting it to filing it and then getting through the patent office to when it finally issues. Okay. But I don't know your technology. <laughs> I, I yeah, there's know. a lot of variables. If, if you came if you have a teleportation device, maybe. <laughs> Thank you, Anthony, for your question. I, I, Any other questions? I, I, I appreciate the answer. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Anybody else um, uh, is itching for a question? Um, I, I see another question. Um, is there a template you can provide for a software patent application? Um, I don't necessarily have a template, but what I'd suggest you do is to, again, depend on exactly the technology and the area of even the software is um, do some searching and find a the closest patent that you can find that's similar that's been granted, and uh, that would at least give you a great starting point, I would think, to to see what what your application would need to have to also get yeah. through the patent office. Yeah, that, that's excellent, Greg. That, that's a, a good suggestion. One thing I, w I would add is you know when you, when you're looking at that. It's the substance. I, I've actually had inventors come to me and say, look, I've worked many months on this application and now I want you to file it. And, I, and, and they give me this document and it, all the time they spent was on figuring out the fonts and the way the figures are to <laughs> match what they've yeah. seen in other patents. The patent office does all that. Don't worry about, you know, the the format of the, the, the text and all that. It's the substance of, you know, what does this document actually say? That's what your patent attorney wants to get from you. That's what will be filed. And the patent office will do all that formatting. Yeah. And um, uh, if I, was, it was, I was gonna add something to what you were just saying, um, Bruce. Um, uh, oh yeah, so the, the patent applications, you know, they are a marketing tool, especially for small companies. And so, when you write a patent application, it may be worthwhile to have some upfront information, again, describing what the, pro the problem in the industry is and why this is important, why it's hard to solve and how your invention is solving it. Um, but again, that might be really good for investors and uh, as some um, um, promo for the company if the patent is published or granted. But the examiners, you know, they may care about the problem and solution, um, but they really care about the claims. It's all, for, again, it's all about the claims from it. They look at the claims word for word and you know, they, they interpret the claims with the broadest reasonable interpretation based on the spec and the figures. And so uh, that's, that's where, um, it, it, could, it is hard, it's hard to take an invention and say, what is the most concise way we can describe what we've invented? And that's always a good starting point is try to, you know, just if you were going to write on a business, back of a business card, what would you say your invention is in, in, in structural technical terms, as opposed to what problem it's trying to solve? Mm, yeah. All right. Well, very good. At, at, uh, any other questions? Oh, here we go. We have an, another um, uh, hand raised. Um, Anthony, again, I'll uh, allow Anthony to talk again. Go ahead, Anthony. I think he's still muted. Yeah. Um, so I'm sorry. Can, there, can you hear me now? I'm sorry. I guess yeah. I, you hear me I'm driving. I'm driving from San Francisco to Los Angeles, by the way. So I'm on highway. I'm, I'm on highway five right now driving while I listen to your talk. Excellent talk. Quick question. I've heard the concept of your invention is being seen in the wild versus versus it's in a data center. In other words, you're developing an algorithm that's only seen in the data center versus you're developing something in your garage and your neighbor sees that. Now, is it true that because your neighbor sees, just sees that invention in the wild, in other words, he sees it out of his front window, that he can put a claim on it? Is that, is that concept true? Well, in your hypothesis, in your scenario, your neighbor didn't invent it. He just looked up, peeped through your window effectively and saw it, is that right? Yes, yes, yes. Well, then he's not the inventor. And he, okay. he, he should not be allowed to get his own patent on okay. it, right? 
Now, uh, the, the other thing that I heard maybe that uh, adds to this is no one who's not an inventor can be part of, you see, you can't bring your neighbor or your cousin and put their name on a, on a patent application because then you're violating, is that correct? That, that's something that I do talk about with clients to make sure that the list of inventors are the list of people who contributed to the conception of the invention. That nobody's being listed there for an attaboy, right? A pat on the back. Hey, you know, you're, we like you, so we're going to give you, we're going to list your name. Well, if they didn't contribute to the conception of the invention, they're not an inventor. And that can be really detrimental because that's an Achilles heel that we didn't talk about as um, a uh, basis for, infr for invalidity, but that by, by having the inventor list be incorrect can indeed be a way to invalidate a whole patent. And so you don't want such an Achilles heel on your patent because you gave somebody an attaboy by listing them. Conversely, you don't want to omit somebody who did truly com contribute to the conception but for whatever reason you didn't include. Oh, well, they left the company uh, six months ago on bad terms, so I don't want to include them. Well, oh, so that's it not works problem. both ways then. It does work both ways, yeah. That's right. Very interesting. All right, thank you. All right, Anthony, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. All right, Any anyone else uh, has a question? Uh, I see that uh, Mohan's asking about websites. Yeah. Uh, Greg, Greg's slide, it was slide 10 of the presentation, had uh, uh, two important ones. W one of which is just, you know, patents.google.com. Uh, so that should be easy to find uh, as a way to do some at least initial patent searching. And then the other one is the USPTO's website, which has a little bit more of a complicated uh, 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 web address, but right. it's, it's patft.uspto.gov. Okay, well, uh, I, if there are no other questions, uh, I really want to thank both of you. That was, like I said, I learned a lot and I thought I knew something. So thank you so much, Greg and, and Bruce, for uh, this so valuable webinar that I, I learned so much from, and I'm sure all the attendees have. Uh, this is recorded, so uh, we will post it. And also, if the attendees want um, a copy of the presentation, can we send it to them? Yes. Okay. So anyone with uh, that would like a, a copy of the presentation, we will send you a copy of that. Um, so right after this, like I said, we uh, we have the virtual networking. Um, so the, uh, the link has just been posted. Uh, and uh, if you were asked for a password, it's Kenobi 2020 VIP. Um, and yeah, we can jump into the virtual networking. Thank you very much, uh, both Greg and, and Bruce. And uh, we look forward to seeing you again. I know you have other webinars as well, and we'll, we'll see you on the live judging panel as well. Yeah, so quick at, quick uh, advertisement for the other two presentations my firm's giving. Yes. Both, one is a week from today, and one is two weeks from today. Uh, one will be discussing the overall patent process, uh, and another one will be talking about uh, agreements and IP provisions and, and agreements. All right. Thank you very much, Bruce. Yeah, please stay tuned. Um, uh, we're reminding everybody every week uh, of all the different events that we have. So uh, uh, there are a lot of things going on in October. So thank you again. And uh, let's jump uh, to the networking side of this and see how we can meet others as well. Bye-bye.